Hello, everyone. We're back for another show. Anything that I say is not meant to give you a diagnosis or even reduce your symptoms by 1%. It's uh, illegal to cure people in the state of Virginia. So uh, this is all food for thought and uh, just things that you can do your own research on and um, just uh, check with your doctor. All right. Well, that non-advice is great advice, for goodness sake. So that's terrific. No cures in Virginia, but a lot of good health and all that stuff. So uh, welcome, everybody. we got a great lineup on social media and uh, also on our wonderful uh, video portion of the show. And why don't we kick off with uh, Cindy. Cindy, unmute yourself. And she's coming to us from uh, beautiful Florida. And Cindy, welcome to the Dr. Berg Show. Thank you so much. How are you, Dr. Berg? Doing great, Cindy. Hope you're doing good too. Thank you. So my question is, I was diagnosed about two years ago with type two. Uh, just lost my father from complications. Mm -hmm. um, I was put on insulin, which didn't fare very well for me. So I decided to stop taking it. Um, I adopted a keto lifestyle. I lost about 60 pounds, and I recently started uh, one meal a day. So I feel terrific, but my sugars are still high, and I'm taking the supplements that you suggested. Mm. And I wondered if that's something that will continue, um, because I really don't want to go back on insulin. You know, this, this is a really good question, especially if someone's a diabetic. Um, the advantage of doing keto, especially if you're diabetic, is that um, you're going to get a lot less complications. Your, your inflammation is going to come down, um, and you're going to salvage these four tissues, your eye, your kidney, your heart, and your brain, and your nerves that connect from your brain to your, your toes and your fingers because of peripheral neuropathy. But um, if you go on a low-carb diet, and then your sugars are still high, the question is, that's weird, where's the sugar coming from? Well, it's coming from your liver. Your liver is making sugar, it's called, making new sugar, it's called um, gluconeogenesis. And so it's the making of new sugar. And that's simply because you still have a good amount of insulin resistance. And so there's a, there's a feedback glitch in the system and uh, you just have to give it a little more time uh, before your liver starts making adjustments. Um, I would watch my video on other things you can do for insulin resistance to speed it up, uh, like exercise, of course, and better sleep and less stress and berberine and apple cider vinegar and the list goes on and on and on. And then just give it more time. Um, yeah. Because your sugar is a little higher, you might want to go for long walks to just burn off that sugar. But um, but that's really what's happening. You have insulin resistance. It's probably been there for a long time. And that's why you even had to take insulin because there's resistance. It's not working. And so um, over time, that will improve. Um, so nothing to worry about. Okay. Thank you so much. Well, that's great. I hope You're that, welcome. Hope that helped there. And Dr. Berg, why don't we kick things off with our first uh, question of the day? This is a true falser. Okay, true or false, resistance training, okay, is the best exercise for rehabbing injuries. All right. True or false? All right, folks, dig into that. And I tell you what, we're still coming up with some questions and shout-outs and so on. So let's see. Uh, let me grab a quick question here from social media. Someone from Vietnam checking in. Let's see, I have a family history of pancreatic cancer. How to prevent it, and what kind of tests can we do when checking with a doctor? And boy, that's a tough one. Almost no one survives from pancreatic cancer once it's diagnosed. That's from YouTube, by the way. Well, it'd be my advice, it, it, it'd be my advice with any type of cancer, if cancer runs in the family, obviously, you know, you probably eat or have eaten what your parents have eaten. Uh, you might have similar lifestyle things, I, I would um, do the standard thing. I would uh, under, try to understand the mechanism of cancer. Uh, that really has to do with damage to your mitochondria. And um, so that's the chronic inflammation, chronic consumption of sugar, the chronic 
um, infl um, inflammatory omega-6 fatty acids, um, and then all the other things that people already know, like smoking and being exposed to toxicity. But let's say you were, were given um, these genes that pro predispose you to cancer. Um, what you need, what you realize, what you have to realize is that you can have uh, epigenetic effects that are really, really strong. So that means that your um, your lifestyle changes. And I've done a lot of videos on this. I would get on the standard protocol, healthy keto and intermittent fasting. But I would, to take it up a notch, I would obviously make sure the food is uh, organic. I would make sure that it's grass fed, wild caught. I would also make sure that um, that you um, fast more often. I'm talking about periodic prolonged fasting, like maybe once a week you go 48 hours. Once a month you do 72 hours. That's going to help you greatly. That fasting is going to protect you. But uh, pancreatic cancer, as far as tests go, I mean, there's there's quite a few different tests that you can do to, to pick up pancreatic cancer. But I would, instead of worrying about the test right now, I would do actions that actively and aggressively put you in a place where uh, cancer is a hard time existing. Cancer cells come from your normal cells. Your normal cells turn into zombie cells, and then these they lose their um, mortality. So they can live forever, which is kind of weird. Um, but cancer cells have the advantage of living forever. But um, the point is that you just need the correct knowledge about the mechanism of how it works, and, and then you can then know what to do to avoid cancer in the first place. So I think you can do a lot. So now once you have cancer, that's a whole different story. The protocols are a little bit different. And I, um, unfortunately, I'm kind of, I can say certain things online, other things I'll be taken down. So um, I will have some additional information in the future because right now we're doing some, or I'm not doing something, I'm actually helping fund. And so are a lot of you helping fund a cancer study, which I just got some incredible um, news on. So I'll be putting that um, video out to those who, that donated uh, very soon, but it's very, very exciting. Well, that's exciting. And uh, what Steve, a that was, sorry, that's a long answer. No, well, that's, uh, that, I tell you what, uh, cancer scares the pants off of most of us. So any information you got, any hope, uh, certainly welcome uh, in a lengthy uh, answer. So we're, we're very appreciative of that. Speaking of appreciative, Doran on uh, YouTube claims that you're the best doctor in the world and have a bunch of emojis that support that. So thank you, Doran. There's a lot of people that agree with you, that's for sure. And then uh, Mario. Well, um, get, go ahead go ahead and give her give her that $20 that I promised her. Absolutely, to going out that. to her <laughs> right away. I rolled it up and threw it under her desk. So she, she has that now. And then also, let's see, so Mario Penna says, Dr. Berg, he's been having some really bad anxiety and has a short fuse with heart palpitations. Can't seem to figure out what is causing it. I went ahead and ordered some products, I suppose your products, uh, but it doesn't describe which ones he did. What can we do to help calm poor uh, Mario down? Well, what comes to mind is the uh, vitamin B1, B1, B1. Take it before you go to sleep. Take it when you wake up in the morning. Um, nutritional yeast, you should be chopping on those tablets or in the powder through the day, uh, grazing on it. Um, also, your microbiome has a lot to do with your, your mood, especially anxiety and depression. So if you get a really good probiotic um, and you su start supporting your gut with uh, all those wonderful um, fermented foods like the sauerkraut, the kimchi, and things like that, um, that will actually help your microbes in two ways. They'll feed them the fiber, and then you can receive some of the microbes. Now, I'm not saying those microbes will live in your gut, but what's really interesting is these microbes are very uh, promiscuous. They tend to exchange code, uh, DNA code, a lot. And so if they happen to see a code that they want, whether it's to resist an antibiotic or to survive in some way, they'll grab it and they will start to adapt. So consuming these high quality fermented vegetables from the farmer's market or stuff that you make, you should learn how to make it. It's uh, very, very beneficial for 
your gut. And then, then you can make these neurotransmitters that help your mood. GABA comes to mind, dopamine. And in your gut, 90% of all your serotonin is created in your gut by these microbes. And so here you have the serotonin, which directly relates to your mood. Um, it can, it's like considered the happy hormone. So without this microbiome, um, you're going to be a little on the stress side. Wow. Okay. Well, by the way, uh, let's go to the answers for our first quiz question, which is a true false and said, is resistance training the best exercise for rehabbing uh, injuries, and it's kind of a mixed bag. 60% say true, 40% say false. Who's right? It's, it's, it's true. It is true. Resistance training. Now, done intelligently, right? You have to make sure that you start off slow. You're not going to, like, overload a joint. But to start to do resistance training uh, that's more functional, not isolated to, like, one one uh, muscle group, but multiple muscle groups uh, with enough recovery is extremely therapeutic to those people who had old injuries, that scar tissue that are dealing with uh, um, inflammation. Um, in fact, resistance training also helps in uh, insulin sensitivity and insulin resistance. So I'll be doing a video on it. It's, it's a quite fascinating. And, um, uh, uh, a lot of people, what they do is they go, oh, I'm not going to exercise at all. I'm going to stretch or I'm going to put some ice and heat and just not do anything. And then they wonder why it never goes away. So stay tuned for a lot more data on that. It's a very interesting topic, especially if you had chronic joint dysfunction. Well, that's very hopeful, doctor. And uh, we have got a bunch of people that like the show, like Marin said, thinks you're a great doctor. And so do those people. From the UK and Canada, Taiwan, United Arab Emirates, Spain, Sweden, Germany, France, Israel, Pakistan, India, Jordan, Turkey, Zambia, Chile. Hang on, let me go back to this. Goodness. Uh, Syria, Algeria, Lebanon, Lithuania, Belgium, Peru, Japan, Vietnam, the Philippines, Sweden, Saudi Arabia, Cambodia. Good grace, it grows. Uh, Kurdistan and all across wow. the United States. That is so great to know that people are getting such a benefit uh, from your products and your show and your uh, your social media stuff. It's just terrific. Sandy's watching on YouTube and says, can I get a, a referred pain from an ovarian cyst? That's what she wants to know. Absolutely. Yeah, they can refer right to your sacroiliac joint to, in your back, in the lower back on the right or the left, depending on what ovary is affected. I, I remember this um, gal came into the office with... Um, uh, pain in the back, and uh, I, I sent her to get an ultrasound of her reproductive organs, and her ovary was the size of a lemon, which is abnormally large, and it was referring pain right to the back. So you want to make sure you avoid dairy because of the hormones, and uh, um, you want to start consuming cruciferous vegetables and uh, do organic, things like that, avoid soy. Um, and... Um, there's a really good standard process product for ovaries that I like. It's called Ovatrophin PMG. Ovatrophin PMG. Um, that's a really good one for, for ovarian issues. That's terrific. Well, I hope that helps. Uh, Jennifer from Facebook, why are my B12 levels high every time I juice my greens? And how would you know if they're high? That's interesting, Doc. You mean when you juice the greens or when you drink the green juice? That's the question, because I, I don't know about juicing. But but you know what's interesting about some of these green drinks? Um, B12, the active form of B12, or the B12 in general, comes from um, micros make it, and uh, it's in usually animal products, right? It's not in plants. You don't get B12 in plants. Um, you'll get it in... Um, certain algae, but um, I had my wheatgrass juice powder checked for B12, and it was double the normal uh, recommend, recommend uh, the RDAs. And I'm like, I called the manufacturing company, I said, there must be a mistake here. Why, why is there B12 in the wheatgrass juice? Because of the microorganisms living within the grass make the B12. And it just so happens because it's a raw product, 
that product is not sterilized, so we still have the B12, which is actually fascinating. Um, but as far as your B12s being too high, I don't know. I would need, need more data on that. Um, I have no idea. Interesting. Well, uh, can I have an easier answer, Steve? Do you uh, yeah. Have any easy uh, question? Questions? Uh, well, I bet this is. Yeah. Uh, Nepali from yeah. YouTube uh, wants to know the best way to naturally treat those pesky migraine headaches. Well, because we don't treat on the show, um, what you could do is, as far as the suggestion goes, I think um, what comes to mind when you talk about migraine headaches or headaches in general um, is gallbladder referred to, especially if it's on the right side of your head. Also, if you had an old injury to the head, that can cause a problem. I've done videos on that. Uh, there could be um, high levels of um, estrogen if, it's, if it has a pattern to it. Um, you can also go up with your sea salt to actually get rid of headaches as well, especially if you start keto and getting headaches. Um, but I've actually had several videos on migraines and headaches and what to do, so you could watch those. There's quite a few different things. See, when you do um, the videos that I do, I'm trying to give you a lot of different possibilities, but in the order of most common to least common, because um, it might come from multiple sources. Like, for example, if you're fatigued, it doesn't always come from a lack of sleep. It could come from an infection, Epstein-Barr virus. It could come from other reasons. So I give you all those reasons to look for. Well, that's very hopeful. I hope that works out. Those are terrible uh, events, those headaches. Uh, why don't we go on to the next quiz, que quiz question, Doc? All right. What is the best fermented food for chronic sinus issues? All right. Get on it, audience. And while they are tabulating that, uh, why don't we go to our next online guest? And that's Muhammad. Muhammad, if you would unmute yourself. Uh, you are on with Dr. Berg. And Muhammad's coming to us from Baltimore, Maryland. Hello. Hello. Hi, Dr. Berg. Hi. Thanks for having me on. Uh, uh, I got one question. Since uh, I, I moved on a, a keto lifestyle, fasting a lot, working out, you know, like uh, doing HIIT. So uh, mm -hmm. being a diabetic, I'm still on metformin. And uh, since I'm uh, doing a keto things and all that kind of stuff, and my sugar level has dropped uh, way low now so i think what would be the right time to you know um, get rid of all these metformin and other medication you know like yeah this, well uh, i just want to tell you i just want to tell you that i'm not an expert in medication so what you do see a doctor a good doctor would never want you to take medication diabetic medication if your blood sugars are normal or low because the purpose of the medication is to lower it even more. So then you end up with hypoglycemia. So as you improve, you want to find a good doc that can work with you. You might want to uh, do a search on Verda Health. There might be a local doctor you could find that understands blood sugars and keto, and that can work with you to come off this medication because um, especially if it gets down to a normal range, why would someone need uh, medication if their blood sugars are normal? That's the question. Right. Uh, but also, in addition to that metformin, if you ever, if you're taking it, there's a, you want to make sure that you're taking the B vitamins with that because one of the side effects is lactic acidosis. And the remedy for that is B1. So just make sure you take that to counter that potential side effect. It actually, I think, if I'm not mistaken, has a, like a black label, so it's a, <clears throat> it's a more of a severe side effect. But yeah, the whole goal is to work, find a doc that can work with you to, that has the viewpoint of coming off medications over time if, if you can get to the root cause versus the viewpoint, no, Everyone's going to be on a medication. There's nothing they can do, and you're just going to have to keep taking it. Well, find a new doctor. Okay. Thank you. That's my advice. I'm sticking to it. 
You're welcome. <laughs> That's great. Thanks so much, Mohammed, for joining us from Baltimore. And uh, we have a question from YouTube, Manav, or Manav from India. Could you make a video or two on Indians on the Indian food supply? I'm, I'm not sure if it's the Indian food supply, but, you know, just maybe what they can do to keep a keto healthy lifestyle and do intermittent fasting, given their sort of traditions with food in India. Well, I'm making a note right now. Um, I know that the good thing about in India, they have very low level sugar and starches in their food. So I'm being very sarcastic, but um, yes, there's a lot of things that you can do um, to have a good keto lifestyle. In fact, I, I've heard even that there's even keto restaurants going up in India too. So I think it's going to be the next wave of the future um, simply because they have a, a lot of diabetes and health problems that can be completely prevented. So um, I made a note, Steve, on that. I will do a video on that. Well, that's great. And I'll tell you what, buttered naan. I mean, it's so addictive. How can you not oh, eat that stuff if it's in front of uh, you? Steve. It is so good. I'll tell you what. The spices that they use are just incredible, incredible. Oh, they are. Chicken so, masala, and uh, oh, it's just so terrific. And, and, you know, but they throw a little stuff in there that probably uh, causes that diabetes, but uh, bless them all. Anyway. Like, like the rice? Oh, oh yeah, yeah. That's right. It's good, but, you know, there's a consequence. Okay. Let's get to some answers here. So yeah. our latest quiz question asks, what's the best fermented food for mm -hmm. chronic sinus issues? And our audience claims 77% uh, say kimchi, 13% say sauerkraut, and 10% say fermented vegetables like beets and cucumbers. Are we on to something, Doc? We are on to something. Um, kimchi is the answer. Kimchi has a very spe a specific microbe that's very beneficial for your sinuses. In fact, if you even dilute the juice and you put a couple drops with a uh, Q-tip in your nose each day, you can see great benefits. I have done a video on that. I will be doing another video on that. Um, there's even a, they've isolated a microbe and you can take it as a supplement. But I think um, these uh, fermented products are just fascinating. These microbes make all sorts of wonderful, beneficial things for us that we can use. I mean, the microbes, uh, um, develop enzymes to break certain things down. A lot of the, the drugs that we use are based on inhibiting certain enzymes, <laughs> which microbes can help you do as well. So um, there's even microbes that can help um, recycle or help you break down plastic. So they eat plastic. I mean, so f as far as for the environment goes, that's incredible. So uh, I'm just very amazed at what these microbes can pull off and uh, we need to protect and support our own microbes in our gut and throughout our body. So, um, yeah, I think they're very important. Well, that's terrific. And I'll tell you what, this is a, uh, a question that comes close to my heart. Amit from Facebook wants to know if nutritional yeast can trigger insulin. Can I take it before bedtime? And I'm listening to Amit. No, no, it's not going to trigger insulin. It's very low calories and, um, uh, there's no carbohydrates in there. Um, nutritional yeast actually comes from a microbe and uh, they, these microbes make B vitamins. And so there's a lot of other things in nutritional yeast too, like uh, there's amino acids. There is, um, but it's not enough to create a spike in blood sugars. Um, amino acids and then even trace minerals too, which is actually quite amazing. So you're getting a, a really good, good thing when you take nutritional yeast. All right. Well, that's terrific. Now, let's see here. Let me delete that. Why don't we move on to the next quiz question, Doc? And here it is. All right. What is the best vitamin for arterial stiffness where your arteries become stiffened and um, that could lead to high blood pressure? So what's the best vitamin for, for that? All right, that's terrific. Let's go back to Face Media. OJ from Facebook, what is the best way to address PCOS? My friend is bleeding excessively, uh, excessively excuse me, during menstruation. Polycystic ovarian syndrome. And by the way, I just did a video. I don't know if I released it. Yes, I did. That uh, men can get a ver their version of PCOS, which you'll have to watch that video. But 
the the simple thing is to understand that that androgen that's too high is coming from high levels of insulin. So we come right back to the main theme is high insulin from too many carbs. So if you go on a low carb diet and you fast and you ro- reduce your insulin, you will then reduce the androgens that are causing the facial hair and the hair loss and the deeper voice because women normally should not have excessive amounts of androgens. They just need a little bit, not too much. So um, that is the secret to the PCOS. Um, it's, it's just understanding the conversion of what triggers androgens. That's true. Well, I tell you what, uh, Dr. Berg uh, takes eating to the next level. He's a very organic and earthy guy and uh, will actually grab eggs from chickens and so on. So this is a, uh, a question that's relevant. Jennifer from Facebook, are duck eggs as good as chicken eggs? Poor thing is allergic to chicken eggs. They, I think, are a little bit better. Um, I actually have some duck eggs, right, duck eggs right now. I just, this morning, I walked down to the pond, and I found a duck egg. So I'll be eating that at lunchtime. But they have um, they have way more um, egg yolk. And uh, they're, they're similar nutrition, but they have a, more cholesterol. And you say, well, is that bad? Like, no, your cholesterol is needed for quite a few hormones. Estrogen, progesterone, testosterone, cortisol, which is your stress hormone, and even uh, your brain needs the cholesterol to to work. Uh, so if you're deficient in cholesterol, there are so many problems you're going to run into. So the duck eggs have a little bit more because it's uh, they have bigger yolks, and also you have a bit more lecithin, which um, helps to keep the fat off the liver. Um, I will be releasing a video, maybe I'll do it tomorrow, on the difference between a duck egg and a chicken egg. But I would, I would go after that duck egg, if I were you. All right, well, that sounds great. Well, I tell you, some of these questions on social media, you folks are so naughty, and you know we can't ask them. But there are a great many questions that we can. Let's see, uh, Airway on Keto wants to know if they can fix, uh, I don't know if Airway is a... Which gender we have there, but a thyroid problem. My thyroid does not work. Gaining weight plus hypothyroid, uh, diabetes type 2, beta blocker for heart palpitation. Uh, can I get your team to discuss this? That's tough. I think I would just, I, honestly, what I, would, I would start just with the basic eating plan, healthy keto and uh, intermittent fasting. I have a wonderful complete download right on my site. You can get that uh, for the, especially if you're new to this, but the hypothyroid condition usually is Hashimoto's. It's an immune problem. It actually starts in the gut. Selenium, selenium is a very important mineral in that, in that condition. It's an antioxidant. So it protects against all this inflammation that's happening when you have an autoimmune condition. Vitamin D is another really, really important one, but I don't think that's going to do much if you don't change your diet first. And then, of course, the diabetes is a no-brainer. You just need to go low-carb and fast, and you'll see fantastic change changes. I mean, um, there's some really hardcore research right now that um, that you, you can't you can't even refute um, any other diet other than a low-carb diet for diabetes. So, um, Verda Health, uh, if you go to their website, they have some some research that I think um, a diabetic should study because it's very credible. And you give that to your medical doctor and they can assess it because a lot of times they want to see the study as well. It's all there. All right. Terrific. Let's get some answers from uh, quiz question number three. And the question asks, what is the best vitamin for arterial uh, stiffness? And the audience comes back with 70% saying, Vitamins K2, D3, 20% say vitamin E, 6% say good old vitamin C. Okay, so the answer is vitamin D, but also vitamin K2 will help. But vitamin D is the primary key uh, vitamin uh, because uh, you have a lot of receptors in your artery, arteries for vitamin D. Um, and Vitamin D is, is one of the best natural anti-inflammatories. And so it actually 
relatively low amounts of vitamin D in a relatively short period of time has been found to um, reduce stiffness. Now, if you were to also then add a low carb diet and also add intermittent fasting to that, then you're really going to go go see some results. So, um, and as we're talking about stiffness, we're talking about losing the elasticity of that artery that you need normally to keep your blood pressure in check. And if it's not in check, then that stiffness causes a lot more stress in the heart. The heart has to work harder to pump. And that's when you get the edema in your ankles and you get congested heart failure. So um, vitamin D, which a lot of people are deficient in. Um, a couple reasons why we're deficient is we don't go outside very much anymore. And then um, we don't expose the skin to the sun. Um, it's very difficult to get it from the diet unless you're eating a lot of fatty fish. Uh, and also the older you get, the less vitamin D you can absorb through the skin. The darker your skin, the less you can absorb. And the more overweight you are, the less you're going to absorb too. So if you have someone that is older, overweight, and they don't go outside much, they're going to be very deficient. And then the arteries tend to get stiff, blood pressure. So, yeah. Well, that's hope, interesting. And you that know, gave you a couple things, Steve. Well, you sure did. In fact, I'm gulping a couple of your uh, uh, vitamin D at night and it has definitely helped me sleep. I didn't know, I heard you talk to another uh, listener some weeks ago and I've adopted that and, uh, and it seems to be working terrifically. So a, a 20,000 I use before you just, bed. You know, I, if I would just experiment if I were you, I'd, I would try to take it at different times of the day, but take one at night because it's really good to reset jet lag. It's, it's really good to, to help with sleeping, believe it or not. So, it has, there's receptors in your your suprachasmatic nuclei in the brain, which is the clock, which is the pacemaker of your your circadian waves. It's like the clock that regulates your sleep sleep pattern. So um, try it out and see see if it works better right before you go to bed. It won't keep you up. You you think it would, but it doesn't. But it's um it's good for sleep, which is actually quite interesting. Well, that's my finding for sure. Benedita from YouTube wants to know what could cause being short of breath all the time. Thank you for all your good work. He said, boy, that's a tough one. Well, um, <clears throat> I would need more of a history, but I have done videos on this. Um, let's say, for example, you go on keto when you're short of breath, right? And especially if you start exercising and you just run out of air, that means you need sea salt, sea salt. Um, it could be also your adrenal issue, have adrenal issues. It could be, um, that you need B12, but sea salt is one that, and also if you're exercising, you might need more potassium. So we're dealing with electrolytes. So these are just things that, um, can cause, um, that symptom as well as just not sleeping enough. So you can be out of breath as well. And then, of course, you have a million other reasons, something going on with your lungs. Um, but I would first try sea salt. That usually works pretty well, especially if you do keto and you'll end up with that symptom. All right. Why don't we select somebody from our green room? We've got John from Manhattan, uh, and he's in muting himself right now. And uh, hang on, John. No, I'm falling short on my job. There you are. Welcome to the Dr. Burke Show. Hello, Dr. Burke. Hi. Uh, it's an honor to talk to you. I uh, started keto on June 9th, and um, as of last Saturday, I'm down 16 pounds. The wow. reason I started, yeah, yeah, it's great, about averaging about a pound a week. Uh, the reason, and I had seen your videos for a while, but I never pulled the trigger till June because I, I hadn't gone to the doctor since the before the lockdowns happened. And I went, and my glucose went from, in 2019, 107, it went up to 241 from eating a lot of delivery because <laughs> I wasn't going out. Just wow. getting, I was doing the super size. Wow. It has come down in September. I took uh, another test, and it's now 112 after three months of keto. Wow, that's great. So that's great. The, the cholesterol went up, <clears throat> and I know that in your videos, you, that's kind of par for the course when you do keto. But my doctor, uh, who's a holistic doctor, did do the lipo, 
the, the lipid profile, the advanced one. Mm -hmm. uh, and there were some things that were concerning. Now, the triglycerides went down from 194 to 113 from June to September. The HDL went from 48 in June to 44 in September. The LDL went from in June in 148 to 185 in September. Um, but what concerned her was this thing, and I don't know if you know what this is, LP, PLA2, which she says is a marker for inflammation, and that's at 185. Um, but the other thing was that um, in the advanced lipid profile, um, I didn't, I saw your video where you talk about SLDL is the number you're looking for, where your wife took that test. And she yeah, had it's kind of S, S, SD. SD. Well, actually, oh, yeah. it's, it's, a, it's a small, small dense uh, particle. Because it's a little different than um, than the typical test LDL. So so we have the large uh, buoyant type and the small dense particle size. Um, did you get that data? Well, what I got it says LD particle number. Then it says LDL small, LDL medium, HDL large, LDL pattern, LDL peak size. Okay. So okay. I'm assuming LDL small is the one that you were talking about, or no? Yeah. Yes. Yes. So what that number. That? That is 525. Okay. So that's why she, she might be concerned in that. It's a little high. Okay. Okay. So this is interesting. Cholesterol is a very complex topic because there's a lot of, you have a, a lot of new terms and things. Um, the fact that your, your triglyceride came down is really good. Um, but um, I would... <laughs> I would love to, and I don't have time to hear, but just to make sure that your basic keto that you're doing is um, is the healthy version and you have, it's not the dirty keto. Um, so do you feel that the version of keto you're doing is, uh, first of all, healthy, and are you doing it standardly or are you kind of doing sort of keto? So I am taking, so I'm basically these days, I'd say about 80% of the time, I'm making my own food. I'm getting grass-fed beef. I'm getting grass-fed hot dogs, grass-fed stuff. But I will supplement from time to time, like this morning when I didn't have time to cook, where I, I did order delivery, and it was bacon and eggs with cheese. And, you know, I don't know what they use to cook on those. But that's that's less. Um, I was eating the salads, the the, the, the salads, but I, it was, I just found it hard to do that. So I've been taking the... Um, the ones that you make, the the, the cruciferous tablets, uh, the capsules. So I've been taking those every time I eat. So I take two of those every time I eat. Um, and so in terms of the weight and how I feel, it's been going better. I don't have a base. I don't know if these numbers have come down. I don't know if these, yeah. these numbers have come down from, from September or not. We'll see in December if these numbers are coming down, right? So yeah. I have a feeling it's probably much higher before that because I, I literally was doing the supersized diet during the lockdown. Oh, uh, yeah. I mean, not McDonald's, but just delivery from, you know, restaurants with all the yeah. oils that I didn't know about, you know, those seed oils and stuff. Um, yeah. So I'm just so if your wife had had a high LDL small number, what would you have done? Is the question. <laughs> um, if uh, I would reevaluate. Um, her diet, because that small particle um, is a direct relationship to the amount of carbohydrates. That's like the biggest indicator. Um, and also, um, it might, you know, you've kind of went off the wagon for for a bit of time, and you gain all this, this weight and things. And, you know, all these other great things have happened to you, right? But this one thing is still an issue. Um, I bet you anything the first test you did was a lot higher, so it's probably coming in the right direction, but you don't know yet. So um, you can also take uh, niacin, the, the one that flushes you. Um, that niacin also will start beefing up, no pun intended, your your HDL. Okay. And the other thing that you could do is to take the tocotrienols, which uh, you can look online and try to find tocotrienols. It's a type of vitamin E that will protect the inside lining of your arteries against, if there is truly too many uh, small, dense particle size uh, LDL, that tocotrina will protect the inside of your arteries. So that way you won't have the complications of, of, of those things. And then 
Did you say that your cholesterol is high in general or not? Well, yeah, it went from, uh, so in 2019, it was uh, 20, 212. In June, it was 229. In September, it went higher to 253. But the so LDL, I think, hmm? go ahead, sorry. But I'm just saying the triglycerides went down. Uh, yeah. So, so picture what's happening, right? <laughs> You're losing all this weight. <clears throat> you may need to continue to lose some weight. And your fat cells uh, com are composed of triglycerides and cholesterol. Well, your body can burn triglycerides as fuel, but it can't burn cholesterol. So that cholesterol has to go out to the liver. And so you may benefit from a little more bile salts, like the gallbladder formula, just to, just to kind of help you mobilize this excess cholesterol throughout your body. And I think that's really going to tweak a lot of things for you. Um, and also, um, there's probably a fatty liver that needs to be dealt with too. So that could be another thing that you're working on. But I think I, over time, I was you're diagnosed. Be in the right that. Okay, so then that that could explain why the cl the cholesterol values are not quite perfect yet. Just because if you have a fatty liver, you have less function in your liver to deal with these cholesterol particles. Right, and then so, taking these cruciferous things will keep me from getting more fatty liver as I lose weight. Um, I think I think you should also add the veggie solution that I have because it's a you might need more of those greens than just the the, the cruciferous because uh, you just need more quantity of uh, the veggie solution is kind of an alternative for salad. The cruciferous is more supporting the liver, which is good, but it's not necessarily a replacement for a salad. Okay, I do have that. And I stopped then, taking that. Welcome. <laughs> yeah, the veggie solution, um, we might have some left. Um, you could probably try that. The other thing, too, is to try to find some vegetable that you really like. I don't know. That might be hard, but find something, cucumbers or, or sauerkraut or something that you can do uh, and, and really work on that because I think um, it's going to help you. You know, your gut makes um, – but we need as a backup if we're deficient from the liver source of bile. So very interesting, John. Thanks for the that data. That's great, John. It's great, John. All the best with you on that. And uh, by the way, Dr. Berg, common theme, people talking about being diagnosed with gallstones, speaking of bile. And, you know, a lot of people, including my wife, get them ripped out. And then I don't think I see a lot of improvement. I think there's as many sort of downsides to that. But can you live with a gallstone, excuse me, a gallbladder that's infested with gallstones? I mean, what, what do you do? Well, you, you just have to understand what causes gallstones. Um, they don't really talk about that. That's a, it's a super concentrated amount of cholesterol without enough bile. So your cholesterol to bile ratio is off. So why don't we just put the bile back in there? What, what could be slowing down your production of bile? Well, it could be you don't have enough of the microbiome because you recycle a lot of the bile from your microbes. Or it could be you have a fatty liver, which a lot of people have and don't even know of, especially if they have a gut. So if your body can't produce enough bile, you might need to take some for a while until you can get the fat off your liver, which, by the way, um, I released a video um, this is some hardcore research that you can reduce 50% of the fat on your liver within just 14 days of doing a ketogenic diet. Now that's, that's huge, which is then going to increase your, your ability to make more bile and keep those stones, um, out of the gallbladder. So yeah, bile is what you need. And I, I think I probably have close to a hundred videos on this topic. So if you have this problem, get more knowledge on it. And so you can, you can control it better. Yeah, that's great audience. So dig in at drberg.com for all those great videos. We're going to be going to Jamie from Pittsburgh, but let's throw another question out before we do that. And here it is, Dr. Berg. All right. True or false tears of your tendons are a common source of joint dysfunction. So, um, little, let's say micro tears in your tendon, um, are a common source of joint dysfunction. What do you think about that? Is that true or false? All right, audience dig in. And now we present to the world, Jamie from Pittsburgh. You're on with Dr. Berg. Hi, Dr. Berg. Um, thanks for giving me a second. My question is about bulking. 
I've cut as much as I want. I've lost about 80 pounds. I would like to start bulking and still try to stay in ketosis, but I'm getting different information about what my ceilings could be, what my nutrients could be, like how much protein can I have, fat, etc. I'd like if you could get, break the tie, for lack of a better term, and give me your thoughts. I live a very active lifestyle. I love lifting weights. Love it. But I'm not eating right. enough. So I'm trying to find out what yeah. my target should be. If you give me some any advice on that and any advice on bulking, that would be great. Thank you. Yeah, the problem is with bulking is, is that a lot of people do it with a frequent frequent meals and then they add the carbs. Well, that's definitely going to work, but it's going it comes with a package. So I would recommend to try to keep your carbs at the threshold of not over 50 grams a day. Um, and then what I would do is 40 somewhere would be okay. Yeah. But keep them at 50, keep your carbs is at 50 a day, which will then give you a little more insulin is an anabolic hormone. So, you, you know, I think you'll be fine if you keep them at 50, but then you're right. You have to figure out how you're going to get enough volume of food. Um, so, um, first of all, you're going to have to probably add more fat and maybe a little more protein to the meal because what's left can't you can't bulk up on salads um and then All right you know i would do two meals uh, a day and uh, just start increasing your calories the quantity of food and you might need some digestive enzymes and things like to help you but um and then like you said you well you like uh, lifting so it's it's really what creates the uh, muscle uh enlargement is the um is the stimulus of uh working that muscle with enough volume. So I think uh, you're right on track with that. If you could really hit those workouts and hit those muscles to, to get them to respond and um, have a hypertrophic eff effect, that that's what you want, but you need enough calories to do it. Um, I wouldn't recommend snacking if possible. Um, I know a lot of people recommend that, um, but you know, some people can do it. Um, some people can get away with more carbs and they can get away with more frequent meals if they don't have insulin resistance, <laughs> if they haven't abused it. But I haven't really found many people that have that condition. And so they end up mistakenly doing the, the high carb, the frequent meals with insulin resistance. And then they end up with a, a pre-diabetic situation, but they bulked up. Um, what happens when you have insulin resistance and you start to go higher with your carbs is that carbs is then converted to fat not not um it's not actually a very beneficial thing to you so you end up getting fatter and and then you don't burn fat so then you kind of have this fatty muscle look and it's not really good so um that's what i would do you're gonna have to increase the volume the, the calories and then keep your carbs at about 50 grams with a lot of exercise. What about fat and protein? Do you have any idea where I would keep yeah. that? Do you have a, a thought I, on that? I think I would keep your fat. Um, I wouldn't count the calories of fat, but what I would do, I, I would uh, keep your protein like maybe eight, nine ounces per meal. And then I would increase the amount of fat to, uh, to your satisfaction level, to your satiety level. Um, not to kind of overdo it, but just eating until you're like, whoa, I'm done. I'm, I have enough fat, you know, versus. I'm fat, I'm fat adapted. Right. So if I'm you ever adapted. eat. I, I went to 20 carbs for about a month. Okay. If you eat, if you eat a meal, do you feel like you're still hungry at all? No. I'm, I okay, usually good. don't have hunger. That's one of my problems. I'm usually not hungry. Okay, so you're burning yeah, fat, so you're just going to have to probably, you know, add some more fat and play around with it and see how you do because you're not actually picking it up, which is actually a good, good thing that you probably don't have as much insulin resistance as other people. So, I think you're going to be in a little better shape than other people. So, yeah, try a lot of energy. I have no problems in that regard. I feel great. I feel fantastic. That's great. It's going to be an experiment to test out different things to see what's going to work for you, Jamie. That. Uh, one All right, question, intermittent fasting, can you do that long term? Like, can I make that a lifestyle? Yeah. Is there any downsides? I love eating that way. Can I, or do I have to no, vary that more? 
No, no, it's a long-term lifestyle thing. Intermittent fasting is a natural thing that our bodies do very well on. Frequent eating is abnormal, and that's not very good, and people don't do well on that. So, yes, it's a long, long-term thing. Absolutely. Well, that's terrific, Jamie. Thank you so much for joining us on the Dr. Berg Show. And let's see. Uh, let's go to another – oh, answer a quiz question. So here we go. Uh, true, false. Uh, tears in your tendons are a common source of joint dysfunction. And let's see here. The audience says that uh, 82% say it's true. 18% say it's false. Who's right? The false is right. Wow. It's not true. It's, it's, it's very, very rare that you ever tear a tendon. Tendons are so Well, I tell you what, folks, we are so close to the top of the hour, and Dr. Berg has disseminated so many great things to the audience. I think uh, we may want to call it a day, uh, and I encourage all of you to go to drberg.com and uh, you know, also continue to flood us with your great uh, social media content from both Facebook and YouTube. Go to drberg.com for great videos. And I tell you what I'm going to do real quickly in the absence of Dr. Berg. Oh, 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 oh,